morning, and there we go. Uh, great to have you with us. If you're a guest with us, uh, we'll give you a, a special welcome. Uh, for those of you online, uh, great to have you uh, with us as well. Uh, it's good to be able to worship together no matter where we are. And uh, uh, if you would uh, check out your bulletin and all that's in that, if you would fill out your connection card that's in there uh, to let us know that you are here, and you can drop that in any offering that you have in the box uh, on your way out. Um, this morning we're going to start off, and I'm going to bring uh, uh, Sarah up here, and she is going to share with you some things that she has on her heart. Good morning. Good morning. For those of you who don't know, I am Sarah Daniels, the youth director here at St. Joe, and I am in recovery stage of camp. I spent most of June, um, middle school camp, high school camp. I helped Taya do VBS. Taya, who is our children's ministry director, just took off this morning to go to Lakewood with a group of our students, and I'll get to the, who we can pray for on that in just a moment. So um, I know summer is starting to wrap up for those of us still connected with the school system, um, and believe it or not, Fort Wayne Community Schools start school registration this coming weekend, so the kids are starting to get to that mode of uh, trying to figure out what classes, what they need, and all that. We are having, I don't know if you saw the sign, we are having a school supplies giveaway on July 30th, and one of the great things that you all did for us last year was very generous. I don't know if you ever saw the picture, we put all the supplies that we were able to buy um, I convinced Holly, the Faith in Motion person, to uh, director to go purchase, and she was able to get so much that was able to go to St. Joe Central, and then we passed it on to any other um, Fort Wayne Community Schools. And so this year we changed it a little bit, and we're having on um, Saturdays, uh, students can come in here and pick up some supplies. So that gets them ready before school and so the schools don't have to hand it out. So if you need some more information, I know that's in the little parent nook. Um, but today I kind of wanted to talk a little bit more about what this all means. And um, it's always hard for me. We, we throw an amazing Wednesday night program for the kids of our community. Um, and past couple years we've been able to do homework help for middle school so it's become <laughs> with Tay and I it's become an evening picking them up at 2 30 and don't see them leave until 7 30 so it becomes an event um, but the really hard part for me is when I say goodbye to them on um, May, in May our Wednesday families because I'm like they don't attend here so I'm like I don't know if they'll return when September when Wednesdays connect, continue the blessing that I've had this year is we were able to take a, several of our Wednesday students to camp with us. And so I wanted to share a story about, I changed his name, his, I'm going to just call him David, and um, just kind of the growth that he has been part of our program. So David started probably about three years ago um, in our junior program. Now I don't know if many of you have worked with fourth and fifth grade boys, but for when they come on Wednesday night to sit and like listen to a message, um, Wednesday nights are very active anyways, but just to have them sit and listen is kind of hard. And for David, it was extremely hard for him to sit still and just listen to Taya. And so bless Taya's heart, she had like three or four of them that really fed off of each other. And David was one of them. So he was a little bit hard to handle back then. But the really cool part is when David got into middle school, he joined us for homework help. And so um, he was one that I picked up on the bus and you know, um, we get there and they've been in school all day. So again, he's all over the place. But what was really cool this year is I'm starting to see the growth in him. Now, if I hadn't been working with him directly on homework help, I wouldn't have saw how intelligent he really is. Now, 
the only problem he was having was just turning homework in. So I have what I like to call a reward system. Some people call it bribery. My husband calls it bribery. I call it rewards, right? Motivation. And so I gave David some motivation and his grades just improved. Now there was a couple of classes that it didn't work out very well, but I saw how intelligent he really is. And sometimes that gets lost in our squirrely kids that can't sit still, right? They are really intelligent. And so I was grateful to be able to experience that with him. So again, like Wednesday nights, they've been here, they play most of the time. Um, but he went to camp. Now, I was a female counselor this, this summer. I'm in the cabin with the girls, and David was in another cabin um, with another church. But the really cool part was he was with some other faithful students of his age. And so I didn't realize how much that had impacted him until VBS. So we were sitting around, this was the first year we did a middle school VBS, and I was so impressed what David had to say. Now he doesn't attend on Sundays, and a lot of times I'm like, are you hearing me on Wednesday? <laughs> like, I try to get a message on Wednesday, and I'm like, I'm not sure if he's hearing me. Two weeks ago, or a week ago, I don't have lost track of what week it is, he was speaking the gospel to other kids. That is exactly why we do what we do. It takes years to plant that seed, right? You plant it, hopefully you're part of it. So he started on a Wednesday, joined us for homework help. He started doing youth group. He went to camp. And now he's speaking gospel to others. The compassion that came that he showed on VBS to the younger kids, I, I probably wouldn't have seen at school. That is why we do what we do. Now I'm up here asking you, Taya and I need help. School is right around the corner. We usually start our Wednesday program after Labor Day. We need you. We, Tay and I do all the work, all the prep work. We just need you to show up and live life with these kids. It's a couple hours. It's kind of, sometimes it's a tough couple hours. Unfortunately, Loretta's not in here. She'd probably speak for it. Sometimes a little harder than others. But what we do in the long term is so impactful for these kids. But I'm not going to let you stop there. We have a partnership with St. Joe Central Elementary, and a lot of times we feed into them with the school supplies. We do teacher meals, but I, I want to do more. There is so much we can do. There's, there's even like lunch buddies where you can sit and have a meal like once a week, maybe once a month with a student that just needs somebody to listen, right? Because a lot of times they're just getting up to talk to the teacher in charge because they just want somebody to talk to. So if they had a lunch buddy that would sit there and just, all right, like, let's get through this meal, you know, let somebody to talk to. That's, that's their lunch buddies. Study Connect. I am not a tutor. <laughs> I'm not a tutor, but I know math. I took it as like an elective in college. It was so easy for me. I do math. Taya does everything else. <laughs> she knows like Spanish, she knows English, she's very good at walking kids through stuff, and I kind of just go around to make sure. Most of the time our homework help, it's not that they need you to help them, like sometimes it's a little bit, most of the time it's just a, a space that they can be safe and study. Some of these kids have kid, brothers and sisters running around that they don't have a quiet place at home to study or even just to turn stuff in. It's that simple. There's crossing guards, Fort Wayne community needs. There is teacher aides. If that's something you have like a few hours just to go do some copying. I know, I think Mary, don't you help with that kind of stuff? So if you have a question on what that looks like, I'm sure Mary would help. It's just time to give a little bit more. And I know what you're thinking. 
I did my time, I, I'm younger. I'm sure if it's not you, you know somebody in your life that may have a few hours to give. And so that's kind of what we're, we're gonna be talking about the next few weeks, is how are we affecting the kids of this community? Making it so they know they matter to us. That they know we're for them. Because one of the things that we are seeing on our Wednesday nights and our homework help, we are doing what we're trying. We're providing a safe place where students can belong and find their, hopefully find their identity in Christ. So this is what I ask, is letting our hearts lead our hands and feet to do work for Christ. Whatever that looks like, whatever age we are, I know some of that looks different for all of us. So just listen to your heart and try to figure out what that looks for you. I'm going to read the names that Taya sent me, I'm going to flip into it right now, of the campers that are with her this week. And as I look at this list, uh, there's a, a few from our Wednesday program. And I know that they just sent New Covenant last week from, um, as we sponsored them. Um, so there's kids that's impacting. Like David, it may come in a different form, right? So let's pray for Taya, <laughs> right? Adrian Spitnail, Case Maple, Juliana Atkinson, Ada and Wesley Moreland, Mara White, and her friend Cora Vale. And let's pray that God can find a way to impact them, whether it's just a mustard seed or it's a new journey for them to go forward with us. And so the next few weeks we're going to be talking, I think Taya is talking next week and we have some other speakers coming. Just take it in and listen to God and his nudges of how he's, he wants you to make a difference. So let's pray. Lord, as we go forward, we all have our uh, worries, our doubts. Lord, you know what each one of us can do for your kingdom. This is not about guilt or shame or, or any of that negativity. Lord, it's just loving. Loving the kids of this community so that they know they matter and that we want them to succeed in life, whatever that looks like for them, for you, for your kingdom. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
Thank you, Jonathan, very beautiful. And welcome, good morning, everyone. So as we begin worship, let these words help center us today. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened for you. Ask and it will be given to you. So now please stand as you are able and join me in our call to worship. We come to you this day with burdens and cares in our hearts. Lord, take these burdens from us and ease our souls. We come to you this day with fear and uncertainty about the future. Lord, calm our fears and help us to place our trust in you. Come, let us worship God, whose love is abundant. Let us praise the Lord, our God, of our salvation, who watches over us always. Amen. So let us continue to stand and worship together by singing our opening hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory. join me as we affirm our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
You may be seated. Let us pray. Sustaining God, grant us this day the blessings of your faithfulness and your grace. Where there is hunger, give us bread. Where there is thirst, give us cool water to drink. Where there is loneliness, give us friendship. Forgive our transgressions and our errant ways, as we forgive those who transgress against us. Where we have wronged another, guide us into reconciliation. And where we have been wronged, guide us on the journey of forgiveness. How long, O oh Lord, will you hide your face from us as our world is ripped apart? We long for the day of your salvation as our lives are tattered and torn. We yearn for you to restore our fortunes as we knock on the door and seek your face. Open the door to us, for we need your presence if we are to be whole once more. Show us your steadfast love, Holy One. Fulfill your promise to answer our prayers, and we will dwell with joy in your house forever. God of manifold blessings, surely your salvation is at hand. In your spirit, steadfast love and kindness meet, righteousness and peace kiss. For your unfailing faithfulness, we give you thanks and praise. Receive what we offer you today, that through the giving of our time, our talents, and our offerings, all people may know your goodness and your grace. Loving Father, let us desire to reflect the nature and character of the Lord Jesus and to show forth the fruit of his spirit in our lives. Prune away all those areas in us that are inhibiting the growth of spiritual fruit being produced in us. And may we grow in grace and do only those things that are pleasing to you for your praise and your glory. We pray today for those who need your healing power and for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. We pray for those who need your help in their relationships. We lift up all these things in your name as we pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
you, ladies, and Jonathan. So we have spent the last few weeks since uh, we observed the, the, the Pentecost Sunday uh, looking at the, the first church that was formed by the Christians. Most of what we looked at has been recorded in Luke, uh, by Luke in the book of Acts. And we posed the question over and over, how in the world did Christianity survive? How do we even know about Jesus Christ? And we've answered that question. The church began as a movement, a movement of people who flooded the streets of Jerusalem to say, hey, a couple of months ago, if you'll remember, you crucified a man named Jesus. He rose from the dead. He was crucified right outside these walls, and, and, and he rose from the dead, and we are eyewitnesses. And this movement resulted in thousands of Jewish people in Jerusalem embracing the simple idea that Jesus was in fact the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that God had raised him from the dead. And as they began to, to be persecuted, they spread out into the surrounding areas. And, and everywhere they went, instead of backing down, they, they were bold as ever, saying, God has done something unique. It's not around a teaching, it's around an event. A man has been raised from the dead. His name is Jesus, and he is the Son of God. And then, wonder of wonders, Saul of Tarsus, the primary persecutor, the one who wanted to destroy this new movement, was converted to Christianity. And he became the number one advocate for the movement. We, of course, know him as the Apostle Paul. And he traveled all around the Mediterranean Rim, and he began to plant little gatherings in all the towns that he visited. And Roman citizens and Greek-speaking people and people when, uh, with a completely different background and culture than his own began to embrace this idea, and it spread like wildfire. Eventually, Nero put Paul to death, and even though Paul was gone, the message continued to spread. And, and here we are 2,000 years later, long after the Roman Empire ceased to be, long after ancient Judaism, the, the one that, that was the foundation of Christianity, ceased to be, long after the final sacrifice was made in the ancient temple. Here we are today worshiping the risen Savior. It's incredible. And the question I want to ask you today, and, 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 uh, and we're going to answer today, is this. Is the church really needed today? Is our message relevant today? If the church were to, to completely disappear, would it make any difference? And I think the answer to that question is absolutely yes, it would make a difference. And I know that there are several controversial issues in the church today, but the problem over the years that we've had is that, that as Americans, this is really difficult for us to appreciate. We don't appreciate what we have. Our thinking and our understanding of right and wrong has, has been so impacted by Christianity for so many years, even if you're not a Christian, that, that it's impossible for us to fully appreciate it. We were born into a culture that uh, where certain values are accepted, certain values were taught, whether that was in school or, or in the home. And those of us who are a bit older would have come to believe that, that most everybody thinks this way. And because of this, we can't appreciate the value and the impact of the local church and the Church of Jesus Christ and it, what, how it has affected our culture. Maybe the best way to appreciate it is to look at it from somebody else's perspective. Philip Yancey, the author Philip Yancey, quoted, uh, uh, he wrote an article about five years ago about, uh, about Christianity in China. And he quoted a statement that David Aikman, who was from Time Magazine, had written from a Chinese social scientist that, had, that was indoctrinated in Maoism. He said, one of the things we were asked to look into was what accounted for the success, in fact, the preeminence of the West, that's us, all the world. 
We studied everything we could from the historical, political, economic, and cultural perspective. At first, we thought it was because you had more powerful guns than we had. Then we thought it was because you had the best political system. Next, we focused on your economic system. But in the past 20 years, we have realized that the heart of your culture is your religion, Christianity. That is why the West has been so powerful. The Christian moral foundation of social and cultural life was what made possible the emergence of capitalism and then the successful transition to democratic politics. We don't have any doubt about this. So what they discovered is that capitalism wasn't the answer to their problems. It had to have a moral basis. And, and this morality that they found in the West with us was informed by the teachings of the church and the New Testament. The key was this fundamental belief, this, this cohesion that brings people together. This amazing sense of right and wrong which just dwarfed them in terms of their belief in human rights and, and, and individual rights. Yancey continues in his article, Several thousand Western Christians have come to China to work as English teachers, and they too have had an effect. Says Aikman, they, have, they behave well, they don't get drunk, they don't flirt with the local girls, they don't have romantic relationships even with other foreigners, they are diligent, and they don't complain a lot. The steady drip, drip, drip of one-on-one -on -one Christian evangelism by these earnest foreign teachers has had a deep impact among young Chinese intellectuals. Almost every urban young Christian I met in China had come to the Christian faith through a foreign English-speaking teacher. You see what they discovered that, that we kind of lost sight of? It's the church matters. The church is needed. The church makes a cultural difference that the things that we love and, and the freedoms that we love and the opportunities that we have as Americans, we want to chalk it up to, to a whole lot of different things, but, but, but those on the outside looking in are saying, you've got a belief system, a value system. You give dignity to, to men and even women and children. And it comes from your Christian heritage. That's the secret of Western success. A lot of times we can't see it. If you hear, were here last week and you heard Dr. Sharon talk about her trips into, into non-Christian countries, you'll remember that she had stories that, that back this up. In her travels, people have come to know the love of Jesus Christ because of the way the mission teams that she served on have treated the people. And the reason that we don't always see this is because we, we think that it all just comes natural. We think our view of right and wrong is just, just natural. But when we look at it through the eyes of someone from a different culture, and we ask the question, is the church needed today? We've got to answer with a resounding yes, because we're not only stewards of the message of eternal life, we're stewards of a message of a better life, a better kind of life, a better quality of life right now. You see, nature, nature in and of itself is violent. And what comes natural is not good. Nature is an earthquake that destroys a country. Nature is a, a cyclone ripping through Australia. Nature, or, or what's natural, is a tornado ripping through a neighborhood. Natural is a, a worldwide pandemic. Nature is violent, but nature at times can be beautiful, but except when you move beyond the beauty of distance and you look at nature, nature is in its essence, violent. You can observe it in wildlife. 
the lions of the jungle, the bears in the wilderness, the crocodiles in the swamps. They all mutilate and devour other animals. It's survival of the fittest. The food chain shows that. Nature is all about first come, first serve, and, and unfortunately, human nature is not a lot different. We think it is because we're Americans. We're not like animals. We think it is because we've been so extremely Christianized that we can't even appreciate it. But here's what human nature looks like. Human nature is racism. You're different than me and I'm better than you. That's human nature, you've seen it. You've felt it, you've experienced that, and even though you would say, oh, racism is a bad thing, you've felt it because that's natural. It's nature unleashed. Adultery. Nobody likes adultery, and yet it's so common. Why? Because it's natural, that's nature. Left to himself or herself, that's what nature is all about. That's natural. Cheating. Cheating, there's a lot of us who don't cheat on our taxes because we think we're going to get caught. But that's the only reason we don't cheat. But if left to our own desires, if you thought you could get away with it, that's what nature does to us and takes us in that direction. Lying, slavery, first come, first serve, an eye for an eye. What we don't understand and what we can't fully appreciate is the church is needed now more than we can ever explain. Because the teaching of the church is the teaching that says that we can overcome and we can create better standards of living and a better lifestyle than what nature left to its own would dictate. And the Apostle Paul talks specifically about this. We're going to look at some verses in his letter to the Galatians in chapter 5. And in these verses, the Apostle Paul is going to contrast for us what nature looks like and what, what people look like when we're left to their own devices. Then he's going to tell the church what they're supposed to look like. And if you look at history, you'll see that these little gatherings of people that gathered around the teachings of Paul uh, that we're going to look at uh, as he wrote uh, this to a group of primarily Greeks and Romans in the area of Galatia as they began to allow their behaviors to, to be shaped and changed by this teaching, it began to impact their culture and, and ultimately it impacted the world. So here's what Paul says, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16, I say, be guided by the Spirit and you won't carry out your selfish desires. In other words, he says, whether you want to admit it or not, if you let nature rule, it's not going to be pretty. If you let your natural appetites and your natural desires rule your behavior, it's going to get ugly. In fact, he would say it's sinful. He goes on, drop down to verse 19, the actions that are produced by selfish motives are obvious. And then he's going to give us a list right here. And, and when he says these things are obvious, he means that these are things that, that either we've done before, or you know someone who's done some of them, or, or at least obvious means that even though you haven't done some of the, these things, if you thought you could get away with it, you would do it. And so here's the list. The actions that are produced by selfish motives are obvious since they include sexual immorality. You can define that any way you want to. Everyone here has something we think is sexual immoral, and while we would reprimand and point our finger at somebody else that was involved in that behavior, at the same time, at some point in your life, you've been tempted to or you've given in to similar temptations. Because immorality is natural. Immorality is the direction that nature takes us. So the list goes on. Moral corruption doing whatever feels good, idolatry, drug use, and casting spells, hate, fighting, obsession, losing your temper, 
competitive opposition, conflict, selfishness, group rivalry, jealousy, drunkenness, partying, and other things like that. And all these things in this list, these are all things that, that come naturally to humans. And we know that we've been guilty of some of these things before. We can all go down these paths and in that direction, and because that's what people, that's what people are prone to do. And because of that, we have to establish laws. Laws say if it's totally up to you, you're going to do something bad. You'll cheat, you'll steal, you'll take advantage of people, so we've got to have laws. And if we get right down to it, laws are the reason that some of you are as good as you are. But if you thought you could get away with it, whatever it is that, that you're thinking, you would do it. So is the church important? Do we need the church? Does the message of the church matter? You better believe it because apart from the message of the church, if things went the way they, th they would go naturally, it would be a society that none of us would want to live in. So Paul says there's something you can do about it. So verse 22, but the fruit, but the fruit of the Spirit... And now remember here, the Spirit is the very thing that empowered the first century apostles and the first century Christians to go out into the street and risk their lives to say that God has done something new in our midst. Spirit, Spirit is what inhabit believers when they say that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He rose from the dead. He died for our sins. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit moves in and begins to inform conscience. It's the Spirit that moves us to live and act in ways that on our own naturally we would ne have never done. It's the Spirit that moves you to live a life that even if there weren't any laws, you would, do the, you would go ahead and do the right thing anyway. So here's, here's his next list, still in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against things like this. First one right off the bat, love. Love is saying that you're first, not me. Love is saying, I'm going to sacrifice for you, even though I know I'm not going to get anything out of it. And you don't find that in nature. You've got a whole list of things then that go, go against nature. I mean, look at the last one, self-control. Self-control runs contrary to everything nature urges us to do. And that last statement that Paul makes is one that we usually just glance right over. There is no law against things like this. That's how he finishes this list of what a person or a community looks like when it's filled with the Spirit. He says, when it comes to the natural selfish desires, we have to have laws to control people's behavior. But when an individual or, or when a family or a community or a culture, or when a nation embraces the deeds and activities that are fueled by the Holy Spirit of God, there is no need for law. You see, you, you never hear somebody say, hey, too much patience over there. <laughs> hey. Cut that joy out. Come on, that's too much love back there. You don't hear it. Paul says when culture embraces and allows the Spirit of God to transform behavior, the need for law is gone. The natural attitude that everything revolves around me is gone. Now it's all about Christ. And now as, as we see things starting to spiral out of control in our country, 
we should realize that the church is needed now more than ever. Even though we have all kinds of problems and we need to solidify some of our values, if we compare it to where we could have been, compare it to where some nations are today, we're basically the fruit of this principle. What's happened in our country over the last few centuries and, and who we are and the things that we understand as right and wrong, they're not natural. We've been taught. We've bought into it. And it's important to say this now because, because the church has always said this. We're not better than anyone else because God makes us better. But our culture, our way of life because of the Holy Spirit is better. And yes, we would love the entire world to, to adopt these values because it provides for a better life. Because as opposed to many other countries, we believe that every person, every person was made and fashioned in the image of God. Males, females, and children alike all have dignity and have value. It's a church that needs to be the one to, to say that. It's a church that says forgive. It's not a or not. It's forgive because you've been forgiven. It's accept because you've been accepted. It's serve because you've been served. It's a church that says value those whose society says have little value. It's the church that says give even when nothing's going to come back to you. Show mercy even to those that haven't shown you mercy. Love your enemies. Pray for those who hurt you. Because there aren't many others who are saying these things. The church is needed today. Needed to be a light in a dark world. This is a message that has shaped our culture. It's a message that has shaped the West. It's a message that, that China looks at and says, hey, that's what we're missing if we're going to be what the West has become. And their motives may be purely economic. But if it opens the door to American Christians and evangelists and missionaries, the Apostle Paul said, I don't care why they let you preach. Just go in there and preach. Because the power of the gospel has the power to transform lives, to transform communities, to transform nations, and even the entire world. Our Christian message is powerful. It shapes people. It has the potential to shape the world. And the reason what we do is important is this, because we've been given the stewardship of a message of eternal life. We've been given stewardship of a message of a better life right now. We can't... We can't turn inwards and keep this all to ourselves. Just like Sarah shared in the beginning, we all need to be doing something and they need help. Because if there ever was a time in our lifetime when it's time for the church to take our message outside and be engaged socially and be engaged in our neighborhoods and to live out all of these values and culture, that time is now. Let us pray. Oh God, help us to, to be bold in our actions and allow the Holy Spirit to transform us and work through us to spread the gospel outside these walls. Our culture, our nation, our world depends on it. So we pray this in your holy name the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. If you would stand as you're able now and let's sing our hymn of sending, Rejoice, the Lord is King.
rejoice, the Lord is king. Jesus is Lord, and, and he's the Lord of your life, and God loves each one of you so much. And we can go with the peace that passes all understanding that if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ and call on him, on him as our Savior, that we will live in eternity in heaven with God. Amen? Amen. So go with that peace and have a great week. In the name of God the Father and God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.